one has ever asked me something more exciting than being allowed to talk uninterrupted for an hour. Uh, so I've taken every single speech I've given in the last year and snapped them together back to back. And I do them all really fast. Uh, unless you have questions or disagree, and then we can have an actual conversation. So if you, uh, I'm flattered, flabbergasted, and enthusiastic beyond words to be here. We've got our company meeting at our uh, Atlanta office in just a few hours, so this was a great fit. Uh, and as those of you find incredible rock stars uh, in terms of software development, account management, and sales, uh, they want to get into healthcare, they should call uh, David Harvey, who runs our Atlanta office, and uh, who will be quadrupling that office uh, over the next three years. So uh, uh, if we need all the help we can get. Clicker, right. Uh, how to change healthcare, a tale, the tale of a biosphere, a breakthrough in a box. There's three speeches for you. Uh, first, though, a preamble. Since we are in a museum type enemy here, I will uh, imagine for you, uh, David will certainly have it built and owned by the Chamber of Commerce before long, the Atlanta Museum of Computing History. Uh, and in the museum, of course, like all museums in the lobby, there will be the Ages of Man exhibit. And just so that you know what I mean when I say that we're a cloud-based service, I thought I would take you through uh, my version of the business model Ages of Man in the technology space. Space is a word that we can use. Uh, it's annoying, by the way, when you use it outside of the room with non-VCs, but we're all VCs in the story, so. Space, in the technology space. So way back in the lower level there, uh, in, in, in the prehistoric, you can't see it from here, but it's Rebootus Maximus there on all fours. And that's the software company, the enterprise software company. And in all <laughs> sectors of society, except of course healthcare, this uh, species is obsolete. Uh, it's dominant in healthcare, interestingly. Uh, and the characteristics of the business model, which none of you would ever find uh, anymore, although it would be great if you could, right? Uh, is that you pay a lot of money up front for a set of instructions that have been written onto a disk, a bunch of if then statements. And as these companies get bigger and bigger, they become millions and millions of statements, and the upfront cost gets massively enormous, right? It all works. It's been QA'd beyond words because it has to work because the maker of the software won't see it when it's live uh, in the server that the buyer has bought, right? So it's very carefully engineered, robustly engineered, and uh, but there's no consequence to the vendor if it doesn't work. So if it's a piece of billing software and you don't get your claims paid or your bills paid, that's not, as long as the software works, it's not the software vendor's uh, uh, problem. And so uh, in other sectors, and still in healthcare, there's a famous salesman mantra, use properly, comma, the Nimbus 2000 will, comma, you know, slice and dice and bring world peace. Uh, there's also very little visibility if you're the maker of software in this sector. You can't see the software being used, so you don't actually know, in your own words, how it's going. There are tribal rituals that these companies, I'm sure some of you have been to them, uh, go through where they light fires and bring clipboards. They're called user conferences. Where the, you know, the, the users try to explain to the developers what's driving them crazy. Uh, at the end of the month, my age trial reverse balance report always generates a fail when it's raining or whatever. It's like, I don't think that's possible. We've genuinely, well, well, what's happening? You know, I think you're doing it improperly. What? You know. <laughs> Which caused the birth of a new sector. Uh, also obsolete everywhere except General Motors and healthcare. Uh, the ASP, the Application Service Provider. This is where Ross Perot made his billions. He watched these poor fools at General Motors try to operate these now unwieldy, complicated ERP supply chain management systems. Well, friends, I'm just going to fill my own installation. I'm making it work like a Swiss watch, right? And he started EDS. And then when EDS became unwieldy, he started Perot systems and made billions of dollars just using other people's pieces of software for them when they became so unwieldy at these user conferences as new versions got built, that entire corporations were kind of browned out by them. That, that's the ASP sector. And today, most hospitals, you know, our friends at Emory are, uh, are running a sizable ASP where they take a very complicated piece of, let's say, electronic medical record software and rent use of it to doctors in the community. I'll host it and it'll be yours, but we'll run the blinking lights for you. 
So that's a common model. Now, from a business model perspective, you have less upfront costs. So now, the, there's actually a little room for a VC in an ASP because you have to buy the servers. The company is responsible for a little bit of the outcome because part of the outcome is the server is running, the software isn't broken, and the data is backed up. So you see, as we move into uh, reboot is less, pay us more on there, the, the guy with the club. Um, it's still an isolated piece of software, and the software maker is not able to see how his or her app is going. But you do uh, pay, the vendor pays a little more and has a little more correlation to outcomes, right? Okay, then you get into the cloud. So there's Mark Benioff in his helmet. Uh, and he was the guy who really made us watch in SaaS space. Still software, but it's sold as a service. Meaning, at any time, if it's not serving you, you turn it off. You have no overhead. Back in the application space, you typically have to pay the lifetime value of the application up front. Right? If it doesn't work, eh, tell them much. Right? It's, your, it's your problem. You didn't use it properly. Right? And so lots and lots of doctors and executives and hospitals in my sector they say, this thing's a disaster. I don't think I can go back to the board and say we have to write off the 40 million we put into it. Right? I'm like, well, you know, cash is cash. If you're going to have less cash every year, you should. It's just paper. It's like, yeah, but you haven't got my board. Right? <laughs> so the SaaS company solved that problem. There's now no upfront cost. I don't know if any of you, anybody use Salesforce in one of their portfolio companies? So I don't know if they still do it, but we were sort of one of the first 10 or 20 customers of Salesforce. And we use it for one reason, it was a piece of shit, but it was free. <laughs> so you could log in and for six months, you could have, you know, put, yeah, put our free sales guys in there. I was one of them, you know, I was one of them. We were like, good, you had me in, you know, look it up. I was like, oh, look, I had me in. You know, it's not doing anything besides what you put into it, which is the problem with software, right? But for six months, we could do that for free. We could log in from it from anywhere. And what was interesting is that Benny Austin came in and logged into the same instance of the same application that me as a customer and my team logged into. So suddenly that bottom business model characteristic, performance disability, is revolutionized. Right? He owns the only instance of this application in the world, and he gets to watch it be used in real time. So he can cheat. He doesn't like people, you know, you can't hear that F bomb. You can see people mashing the X button six times in the web box, and you know they're pissed. You have an opportunity now to change the application <laughs> at night if you want to. You can do a new release. Then you does, well, back when he was thinking, they, you know, did eight releases a year, which I then immediately start doing eight releases a year. Uh, so I can be like him. Really stop talking. Uh, I'm not bitter. <laughs> Still, though, Benioff, as I mentioned, you log into Salesforce.com and you look at, you know, you put your data in, then you close it, you open it up again. Oh, look, my data's there. Hey, watch this. I'll go log in from another machine, and my data's there. But there's no work being done, right? If your sales don't go up when you're on Salesforce, that's not Mark's fault, right? It's still the software is used properly. I say it's going to get there. I'm saying there's going to be cooler boxes and arrows every eight weeks, and there have been. He's even now got an ecosystem of other companies around him, which we're copying. Uh, I hate it, but I love uh, to, to, to fill in pieces of application functionality. But he sees developing, gaps developing, but he just doesn't have the bandwidth within his, you know, okay, faster. Uh, and then comes my favorite sweater wearing, well dressed entrepreneur, uh, Jeff Bezos. And what Jeff does is he says, you know what? The software isn't the product anymore. Does everybody have an account on, on Amazon? Did anyone buy it? Yeah, that was a lot. That wasn't Amazon. They're free. Uh, right, you log in. What is Amazon? It's, it's an app. You compete with Amazon for developers every year, right? But it's not, I mean, it's a software company. It's not selling software. The software really is the store, isn't it? Right, what's the product? What's the thing you get? So now, the upfront cost of entry is zero. Everybody's a member. Everyone's, you know, looked at it. All you have to do is look at it to be a, have a license to it, if you will. The connection to that, the performance visibility is just as good as at Benioff. He's logging in, his employees are logging into the same instance of the same application with all the Amazon softwares, right? But now, connection to outcomes is complete. If you don't buy the book and get it at home and keep it and not return it, 
He doesn't get any money. He doesn't the best software in the world. He can go produce certified C chip, whatever you want, a chamber of commerce to give him a red badge for approval. But if you don't buy the freaking book and keep it, no money for Jeff, right? Which is cost, yeah. Now he's a service, right? To go into a whole wide range of things that are not super efficient uses of capital. In fact, he's proudly had negative uh, capital efficiency every year until four years ago, three years ago. Marching, demanding to have more negative capital efficiency every year. What did he start doing? Buying warehouses, 35 million square feet of warehouses, then buying robot companies to drive around warehouses, then making hardware, right? He's doing it each time. What do I need to do to get more connection between an impulse and ownership, right? He's even now able to squirt you your book, right? Expanding his total addressable market by saying, you know, free overnight delivery of today's newspaper isn't that compelling, but if I can squirt you your magazine, your book, I, I can expand my impulse by getting people what they want, not have their luggage, you know, weighed down. What a brilliant move. Because he's got the range of motion, because his product isn't the tool, it's the result. He's had this incredible range of motion, and I believe that's the era that we are entering in more of the business spaces. That's a retail space. But as we look at where the next opportunity is, certainly in healthcare, it's selling results. Right? We say, oh, doctors should be paid on quality, and not one of us has the foggiest clue. Don't worry, no one watching knows it either. What quality means? A bunch of nurses show up and say, let me read your charts. I've got a federal checklist that determines quality. Oh, baloney. They're the biggest jerk in the world as a doctor who doesn't pay attention to you, has all the right check boxes, right? Click. So here are the services that we sell this way. These are, we are now up to one, two, three, four, five. There's a six, but we didn't make a colorful little logo out of it yet. Uh, no, I guess we had it at the inside. We have five cloud-based services that sell outcomes. So a data collector sells paid claims. The software, the billing, scheduling, appointment, coding software that's used is free, right? You use it if you want to as a doctor, and then as the payments come in, and we will put them in the bank for you and reconcile your bank statement uh, for you uh, against what the, you, you know, we think you're owed. Uh, and then as we do that, you pay us a small percentage of it, right? Clinicals is the same way, but now it's the life cycle of the order. Right? Think about what a chart is. It's a, it's, a, it's a school yearbook of all the orders and, and results. I wrote, I wrote this prescription, I saw this on our pelvis, I, I got this, I wrote uh, this blood test, and I got this result back from that blood test, right? And, but yet, an EMR doesn't make any more money or lose any more money if those get lost. And in fact, 52% of them don't happen, aren't in the chart at day 60 after they've happened. So 52, no, sorry, 48, 52 half. 48% of what doctors have ordered. There's no result, there's no evidence of what happened 60 days after the event in the chart. That's pretty freaking bad. I don't know what the quality committee says about that. So we charge for it by the dollar, by the order. If we go get that order done, get the result back, file the chart, call it with the patient, we get a dollar. Right? Average order doctor does 454 <coughs> things a month in the exam room. So on average, we're 454 dollars a month if we get them all done. And if we don't, we're like Jeff Bezos. We have really great software and no money. He has money, but. Uh, communicator, life cycle of the patient encounter. Coordinator, life cycle of the referral. So if you have somebody moving into a complicated episode of care, making sure that all the little dumb things you have to do before you go to the hospital are there. So this isn't an infomercial for Athena, but the point is I'm trying to show you this idea of services delivered over the internet where the software is the store and the business outcome is the product. And my plug to you guys is venture capitalists is, if you want to get into healthcare, this is a pretty neat place. Because everything sucks, and it's lame, boring stuff. If it's not lame, boring, no one's going to let you do it. Right? No one's going to let some little snippy entrepreneur come in and do it. But believe me, you're OK there, because there's plenty of lame, boring things that are happening badly. Uh, Insight is the uh, former Anna and I, based in Atlanta. We have a big office in Alpharetta. We're both doing it there. Um, so that's who we are. Okay, speech number two. Uh, this is my uh, sort of best crack at a keynote uh, driven at making hospital executives angry, particularly the, angry, the wealthier, the more academic the hospital executive, uh, the angrier they will get uh, at this presentation. So since I'm never going to get it done anyway, uh, I'm okay with it. 
<laughs> now, any of you can show any interest, this slide is gone. But uh, in the meantime, I'm very proud. We all know what the biosphere is, right? It's the thing, it's this incredible regenerative characteristic, this interdependent interaction uh, that makes our planet continue to sustain itself for Gaia and Elton. Right. It's pretty amazing, right? So the car keeps out the carbon and the tree says, well, I'm hungry for carbon today. Right? That's amazing. That's ridiculous that the tree wants to eat the poop of my car. That's just incredible, right? Um, and anyone and all you know the examples in their bed is the birds eat the bees and the fish eat the thing and yeah. Right. And then some rich guy in Texas said, well, I'm gonna build my own. You guys remember Biosphere 2? The billionaire dude? He's like, we're gonna have our own crops and the, the waste from our team is gonna be turned into fertilizer with the crops and the crops are gonna clean the water in the pools that are gonna, you know, he had it all figured out and spent like a quarter billion dollars, which is about as much as one of the typical hospital IT systems costs, which made me laugh until I cried, and then I kept crying. Um, and it was like, it's gonna just be amazing. It's gonna be this region, we're gonna be done with this sloppy, Irresponsible world. We're going to control all our inputs and outputs. Uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't work. Right? The team marched in bravely on day one. Soon there were three factions. They were fighting. Two had an affair with one of them that was married. Then they got thrown out. Then they could believe that the guy who was in charge was such a kook that he was killing them. So he cracked a hole and started pumping oxygen in to the biosphere from the outside, killing the garden, etc., etc., etc. Now, so if you eliminate uh, uh, all humanity, you know, in a super ego uh, from a, a, a community, uh, maybe the biospheres can work, uh, engineered ones, but so far no one's been able to do that, so many think that works. Interestingly, uh, it's exactly what most hospitals in the country are doing today. They are trying to create information biospheres, biosphere three. So has anyone heard about what's happened to employment positions in the last Three and a half years, gone from 20% of positions employed to uh, 60 in the nation. Uh, Emory here in town has gone from, you know, 200 doctors to 1,000 in that same period of time, or some number like that. Um, hospitals have acquired nursing facilities, laboratories, in place. Uh, if a doctor goes and puts up a surgical center, the hospital will go and buy it from them. Uh, in an attempt to own the entire healthcare supply chain. And the, the Ely Mossonary argument, since many do not for profit institutions, is uh, we are going to have more efficient exchange of information. Now, many of you are investing in industries where information is exchanged very efficiently between people who don't own each other, like all of financial services, all of mortgages, all of auto parts, all of, well, pretty much every single supply chain in the world except healthcare, right? And so what's happening, but, but why are they doing it? Well, there's, there's one reason, because there are examples of this. So Kaiser Permanente bought and owned in the 40s everything, right? And they built this company town, it was a steel uh, company, a uh, shipbuilding steel company, and uh, got everybody oriented around this common culture and built out a complete uh, healthcare ecosystem. And it's had been, had been very successful. Uh, with that consistent integrated culture rolling out, and in fact, they're all in one information system. Uh, same thing with the Mayo Clinic, which has been one very tight culture, the Harbin Clinic uh, here, here in Georgia, are examples that have been one single clinic mentality for a very long period of time on one information system. The idea of making everyone do that as the only way of coordinating information, though, seems like a bankrupt idea. Uh, and you'd think that most hospitals would know that, except for one thing, if you look around at hospitals that have done it, one of the favorites is in my hometown here of uh, Massachusetts, uh, Mass Chairman, Man's Greatest Hospital, NGA. Um, went, it was about a 10 year period, 90, no, uh, uh, 89 to 99, where healthcare actually got cheaper as a percentage of GDP and everything. Cheaper, 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 cheaper. Going on, health plans were fighting against each other for share, and they were fighting. Doctors, you're equipping doctors, paying doctors to fight the hospital to drive down the They were paying them a little bit more than they paid them, but a little bit less than they paid the hospital to do their surgeries in the clinic, et cetera, et cetera, disrupting, disrupting, disrupting. Mass General saw this, and they're now in the middle of the beautiful Harvard and now they're squeezing down below the 20 billion mark. That's got to be very painful. You only have 20 billion 
Um, they have 40 billion now, they feel a little better. Um, and so what they did was they merged with the other data at the Medical Center, and they put everybody theoretically on one information system, declared themselves clinically integrated, and then were allowed to negotiate. They were free of any trust uh, law, and over the next five years raised commercial rates uh, 65%. Uh, percent. Um, like expectancy stayed the same, errors stayed the same, nothing was improved from the clinical effect. But other hospitals looked at this and said, well, shit. If, if, if and Obama is going to put 18 million people at Medicaid rates into the, into the fight, my rates on average are about to drop 15%, my margin is about 3%, I can really use a 60% increase in price without changing anything on the commercial side of my business. So everyone is now marching down this path. And God bless them, right? If they can pull it off, we're going to sit there and go, gee, I don't want to let my employees, so I might as well just pay 60% more. Then it'll work. <laughs> My sense, though, is that's not what's happening. This is where the VCs come in. So for the first time since Med Partners and FICOR did those sensational uh, theatrical explosions uh, after making the VCs a lot of money. Uh, so these guys put all this on there, and that's how we're going What's happening now is VC money is starting to go into delivery of care for the first time in a long time. Med Express took VC money four years ago. They are now up to 100 clinics. It takes them one year to get to four million dollars in revenue per clinic, and their EBITDA on each clinic is not disclosed. <laughs> <laughs> it's dying Catholic hospitals are being bought up by the likes of Stewart Healthcare. Uh, Mid Clinic was uh, recently acquired by CVS, but was a venture doing retail in pharmacy. There are four other ventures that I know of on a theme that that go and put little mini clinics inside supermarkets and other sort of old-fashioned retail places that are looking to come up with new reasons to go and use your feet for retail, right? So supermarkets and pharmacies are the, you know, Walmart's got a thousand uh, clinics of different clients of ours have Walmart, have clinics of Walmart. Uh, Target, of course, has quite beautiful uh, little clinics. And what's going on is they're not joining the biosphere, right? Their whole point is that they're going to be cheaper and more convenient and totally unlike the ethos of a sort of downtown academic medical center. You're going to be local to the community, you're super responsive, you're going to have cute mid-level providers, and they're going to do a highly product-managed, uh, carefully defined set of services. It's the un-AMC. They aren't going to get inside the biosphere. In fact, almost all of them now are on a and that's what they'll, some of them will build their own, uh, some of them will join, you know, who are the competitors that you may be funding right now, these bastards. Uh, <laughs> and so information among them will exchange quite freely because, uh, you know, in an internet-based world, uh, this thing where people exchange information between browsers is, is quite done, really. It's not a mystery. Uh, and so what happens is these guys will eventually, I missed a cool little graphical thing here. So they, let's see, click, and then donk. You see the little donk? Ah, can't go in. We're all on Epic. We don't need any of you. We have got all the doctors that we need. So what do the doctors do when they did last time? Anybody in healthcare you see? What did the doctors do last time in the hospital at all Boston? <laughs> So A, they're involved in B, and I get a lot of those clients, you know. They're doctors, C, 40% of your patients. Almost instantaneous, it's like, wow. So these guys are juiced, ready, fired up, they call the next day. Hey, how about that for you? Can I do a visit? Yeah, I mean, I need a tissue, and get a tissue. Yeah, it would be good. That's what I, that's what I said, every single time you finish. This really sweet person calls me. How's that for you? So this patient gets to choose. He touches these things on the outside. Everything flows and moves. If he goes on the inside, oh, I'm going to start getting a clipboard, right? I don't believe that's sustainable. I believe over time the biosphere starts to want the oxygen, the patient flow from the outside, right? They want that. It won't. It'll just take one high emitting. So we had an experience where Target, based in Minneapolis, I think. Uh, and they have 60,000 employees that wear red shirts that connect to red underpants and red socks. I've never met a loyal corporate team, right? And they all go to Target clinics. There's one in their headquarters, there's one in each of their hometowns, because they all live adjoining Target parking lots. <laughs> Both Alina and Fairview are the two big biospheres that sound that have tried to own everything, and they said, well, we'll own your clinics. I said, no, you suck. Like, we're different than you in the way we do service and responsiveness and follow-up. Now, they don't do cancer care in the target clinic, 
right? You probably figured that out someday, but certainly not today. So they need it. Those, those biosphere systems were told, that told Target, well, we can't connect. We have to re-register the base and start over. And they said, okay, then we're never going to send a, one of our 16,000 people to you again. And guess what? They now have seamless connections in through the biosphere. Once one guy connected to the biosphere, why does anybody else want to obey the biosphere rules? Right? So I believe Had to read. 
Um, similarly, on the remittance side, um, we opened up and weighed and then typed in 30,000 pounds of mail uh, from insurance companies. And that was only 10% of the volume. That's the first claim, that we need to have, now that it's legal or it's teeny bit legal, we probably ought to chisel open, the, it's, it's one dollar is the maximum amount of information exchange commission that can go back and forth. Um, you know, which is weird because it's like three data points on a bank transaction and they're charging 350. So I don't know why we couldn't have maybe five bucks, right? Uh, anyway, go figure. We'll get there. I think we've got a pinhole in that biosphere. The more companies start innovating and saying, you know, we could do a lot here if the people were allowed to pay for it. The second idea is the idea of comparative advantage. Because there's no price transparency in healthcare, the usual sort of tidal, just endless, consistent pressure on moving things to the lower capital efficient, more efficient, time efficient uh, modalities of care, locations of care, has not moved very quickly. So lots and lots of things that go on in the hospital actually could happen better in the clinic, and certainly more cheaply. Lots of things that happen by a doctor in the clinic could happen by a mid-level provider. People say we have a shortage of primary care physicians. By my math, we have approximately three times too many primary care physicians and a massive shortage of NPs and PAs. Because you don't go to school for seven years emotionally, financially, intellectually, after you've been to school for seven years, screening people according to its absolute robot checklist is mind-numbing and depressing. And primary care doctors who stay in primary care get depressed. And they either don't make it up, or they figure out when they make it up, and they like let someone else start their car because they know they're going to lose money. So we need a huge number of minutes. and then staff. So if you look at the chronic diseases, the eight, the the the, the, the eight percent of covered lives in the commercial space that generate thirty-five percent of all healthcare dollars, right? There's the three American healthcare traditions: eating like a pig, smoking like a chimney, and drinking like a fish, right? These are life behaviors that are not solved. Monthly in a seven minute visit and an exam. They're solved by people in the community that you know or online that you trust that will help you figure out what a tail is and like it, right? <laughs> Dean Cornish, Clinton's position in the quite a not suffering from a crisis of self confidence, he is kind of brilliant, now has CMS has given him a CPT code for teaching someone how to cook and exercise. The correct person to teach someone how to cook and exercise is almost certainly not enough. The number of opportunities in the sort of Fitbit, Nike sneaker, smart sneaker craze to take on those 8% of patients that generate 35% of dollars just getting restabilized on chronic diseases. Those dollars are just ambulance run, emergency visit, stabilization, release the next morning. For a diabetic, for a CHFer, for a cardiovascular disease, uh, a patient, right? That's what those 35% of dollars are. Total waste, no magical diagnosis work by a doctor needed at all. Huge investment opportunity. And then God forbid, I guess it's now been made illegal by the Wapaka, but maybe the consumer would actually get a number about their care if we let them pay for it. Deductibles are so low that this is probably not a near-term investment opportunity. Although, as employers, Incre this, this, this lack of flexibility, you do get a lot more flexibility if you self-insure in terms of what you do. You can actually make your employees pay more and make more choices. Um, and as that happens, you can start to include the consumer. That would have been a huge investment opportunity, and I think now it's more uh, upstream now. So, network, oh, and then of course, you're pulling the shit work out of all of it. You see that, by the way? That's a graphic right there, isn't it? <laughs> And then look, they all smile. I don't know if you see that. Okay. <laughs> Third point of view. Our exam rooms are very crowded uh, because the entire Greek chorus is in there with the doctor. You ever, what was that movie, The uh, Exorcist, where the little girl like, ah, 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 it did not sound like a little girl, right? You ever talk to a doctor and he's like, I need you to inform me that we're going to see felt a statistically good show. And like, I don't think this guy, is telling you this because he wants to tell me, right? Because he's got to prove that he said it because there's a paper performance program that requires him to check a box that says that he said it, otherwise he can't be a medical home or 
because he doesn't ask you about your race and ethnicity. He doesn't get to check the box that gets him certified for meaningful use bonuses from the federal government. And if he doesn't document in great detail the 82 things that he checked on you that were all normal, in detail, one by one each, he doesn't get to code a level five visit versus a level four visit. And if he gets sued, he can't prove that he didn't check to make sure he didn't have it. So the Greek chorus is the malpractice attorney and the insurance adjuster and the office of the inspector general in Washington that are all in there in the exam room with us while our knickers are uh, around our knees. And it's dehumanizing and depressing for both the doctor and the patient. And you don't need to have it. Because that is actually what I think we want. That's called The Doctor is a Pain by Luke Fields, and I don't know if you can see it on the PowerPoint, but the parents have completely given over their trust to this guy. His, uh, his pharmaceuticals are there in the teacup have been used, and don't appear to be taken aback. His cylinder, that's his extra machine of the time, precursor to the telescope, is behind the hat. And he's driving that, and he is totally present with this patient. He is seeking uh, inspiration from his God or Earth and <laughs> recollection from his training and ideas or evidence that his past ideas are working. He is diagnosing and prescribing at the edge of his skill set. He is totally and completely <coughs> in that moment. No part of him is thinking about the past or the future, certainly not his malpractice coverage and his combat uh, plan. And that's why we have screwed up healthcare so much, because we all feel so strongly that everyone should have that. And I'm here to tell you that all of you and we uh, can make this available to everyone at significantly less than we pay today. If we make those things happen. And I have uh, turned to one of the most inspiring sources insight that I have ever found in my research life, uh, but I, before I have a few more things, but, but before I go there, I have to set up a quick background on why none of you have invested digitally in healthcare by and large, just to be speaking, right? 896 million in all healthcare IT last year against up 15, you know, it's 2.5 trillion dollar market. So, Statistically, it's a nuclear accident that a new company has started in healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> Innovation in any sector needs three things. It needs many buyers. Remember, here's to the crazy ones. Remember the jobs that when no one was buying a Mac, but they kept doing it? They said, here's to the crazy ones. And the six sort of metrosexual art, graphic artists kept buying Macs. And they made it cooler and cooler and cooler. And then we all looked around, sure, why don't we buy a Mac? Right? <laughs> But they were crazy for a while. Like, yeah, but it doesn't connect seamlessly to this piece of shit Microsoft Word that gave you features I don't like. Right? <laughs> any sellers. I don't want that. I don't need any of that. I'm just using Linux. I'm just using Red. I, people choose, or they even choose to not buy, which leads to the last thing you need, which is permission to move about the cabin, permission to buy deluxe, permission to buy economy, and permission not to buy the key to money. So when you're looking for an adventure, to me, an investment, a venture in this space, you know, here's the healthcare backdrop, by the way. There's like 100 payers, and 10 of them represent 80% of the entire, or 90% of the entire market. 10 guys. And one of them is the federal government, so you're not going to sell bitly to them when you start up, right? We're down, out of the 5,000 hospitals in the United States, we're down to 1,600 entities that can buy, and out of 200,000 practices that existed before uh, 2008, we're down to 20,000 that can write a check. So there's not a lot of room for the crazy ones. You can find them, but it's tough, and that's why people don't invest. But again, back to my inspiration, I have found a way. Uh, I get all my best ideas from these people. They are brilliant researchers. I was told that it's inappropriate to play the video, but feel free to YouTube uh, in order to get a detailed background on this research. I will summarize. <laughs> in healthcare, you cannot get a whole customer, but you can get a box. Put it over something and cut a hole in that box and pull that thing out. Then you can put your proprietary junk in 
in that box. It is very successful, and it works, and the miracle of IPO and the other things that happen, you can then open that box and let other people share. <laughs> the VCs don't get to four. We're not gonna put a lot of time on four, but VC is really about one, two, and three. We've gotten to four, and it helps new venture. We'll talk a little bit about four in the end because we want to collaborate um, with every venture that you start around the delivery of health. Let's go through them in some detail. Grab a pile of shitty work that clients hate and suck at. You will never sell Emory, but you can find a pile of shit, shitty work somewhere in Emory that everyone hates and sucks at. It could be keeping track of inventory, it could be finding the abnormal mammograms and then finding the people that never found out about them. It could be all kinds of things in the era of the internet and the flat world. You can pull that work out of Emory and do it your own unique high-tech way, probably at a loss. But that's, I'll, I'll get to why that's okay, but that's why you need the VC money. Right? <laughs> So for example, we're banging away on Athena Clinicals, and we see over here, every time we go visit the client, this stack of faxes. And we're like, we're not gonna buy an EMR, it just makes the doctor go slower, it costs a lot of money, it doesn't get any money, and I can't see how it saves any money. So why would I do it? And then it occurred to me that these ladies are gliding around, the mostly ladies, I'm sure there's some men, um, with these piles of faxes looking for charts. And then they buy an EMR, and the ladies are still there. I'm like, what are they doing? Oh, they're in the EMR department. I said, what? They take them into the back room, and they scan them, and then they pull them up as a PDF, and then they look up that person, and then they type the name of the patient record and the information into the thing. Like, so you just added work? Like you just did more work by being on the EMR than when you're not? Like, well, it's a, it's a quality. It's very high quality. Like, oh, you mean Gladys isn't going to retype it wrong? Right? We double enter ours, and we still have a one, what, about one ten percent, two ten percent error rate. We have 500 pharmacists sitting next to double entering vaccine. So you gotta get a chunk of work, throw a box over, right? In this case, I use the example of, of, of the fax machine. Throw a box over the fax machine. <laughs> then you say, I am gonna do this faster, but if you don't mind, with the power of the internet, I'm gonna do it somewhere else, right? Might do it offshore, might do it in Atlanta, I might do it on our server, right? I want to do it, and I'm going to do it probably at a loss. So when we started doing this for clients, we wrote an EMR, which was the box, we put that out there and said, here, in this window, pre-filed, all organized will be every fax you get matched to the original order, matched to what you found in the exam room, matched to what the client said at home, right? Click, 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 all done, free new, just pay us every time we do this for you, right? And we did it pretty badly, pissed off a lot of people, but we did make a negative 54% gross margin. So we had that <laughs> As we banged away at it with a negative 54% gross margin, we found the seven people who had been foolish enough to let us do this, getting happier and happier and happier. Once we got them to where they were happy enough, we then started to put our junk in the box. So we started to build connect. We started reading the caller ID of these taxes and calling the people saying, hey, dude, you know these six fax numbers? They're all me. You're faxing me 76 times a day. Do you have a computer over there? <laughs> oh yeah, my computer has a fax server that generates the faxes. <laughs> well, can, can I just connect to the computer? Oh, well, let me see. Uh, you know, I don't know. Well, what about this? What if I send you electronically the shit that I'm faxing to you? <laughs> right? That was three years ago we started doing this. We're now at a 50% gross margin on the service, right? It's not as good as we can do because we still have to manually touch, I don't know how much it is now, about half of the total document. Big focus for next year is going in. We have the anodyne team punching into these hospital systems and building connections to each one so that our clients don't have to get these fax discharge summaries every time one of their patients is released from the hospital. This is where you can get outsourcing type recurring revenue to the very stable, wonderful kind of revenue of your VC, and you start to approximate software type margins. Our best collector margins and our best collector markets approximate software margins, but instead of getting a weighted average $2,000 per doctor per year, we're getting an annual weighted average $2,000 per doctor per month. 
but we're getting those software margins because we've automated it like the Visa network or the Amex network, right? Remember Amex? Remember originally Discover with the zipper bags? You'd go, first it was only a private club, and it was like, this is ridiculous. The only way you can have your company pay for working through a private club and it was maybe legal anyway or taxable or whatever. So then they had these little club cards where every restaurant is now part of the company membership of the club, right? And you go in and remember they went, and they gave you a little card, and then you they put a little, all the little cards in a bag, and some guy came in a chevette and threw all the cards in somewhere and then typed them in. Right. And then the really you get like Amex, which is like the cool thing. They would then photocopy all the little cards so you could see them. Hmm, I remember that because I remember how I scribbled my name. Yeah, that's me. Right? Today, it's all electronic and their net margins are 50%. The opportunity for that basic story in healthcare is vast. And then ultimately, it's more vast, not being narcissistic, but a little bit because of us. We've now got 35,000 doctors, we're public, we have a good reputation, we're trusted, and we don't believe we have all the smartest, we do believe in Joy's Law, right? We don't believe we have all the smartest people in the world. We look at the web blogs, we watch people try to use our medical records and our services, and we realize that we're missing a whole ton of stuff, and that our poor 250 architects are never gonna get to happen. So what we are doing is attracting other ventures. The biggest obstacle we have is selling. So few doctors, so little market, I mean, so few unique buyers, so much fear of being the crazy one, right? So little willingness to take a risk. But we've got kind of a safe beachhead into the 35,000 I submit to most innovative, and we're desperate, which works for innovation, <coughs> caregivers in the country. And so what I'm suggesting to you is if you've been ducking healthcare because of the regulatory, because of the obvious reasons to duck it, this may be a time to get in. Aside from the fact that your nation needs it and the amount of money that's being blown for no reason is appalling. So the last piece is to actually bring other people in through the pipe that you create. Because you put the box on and pulled the work out, we can go over here and build an API, never touch that customer, give them the app store type experience. I want to add a voice recognizer to the side of the CMR. Click, oh, it's going to be an extra $10 you know, a month. OK, click OK, they're paying, right? I want someone else to go into my inbox and do the stuff that I don't think is deserving of my time. Okay, here's the little slider to set your care pathway protocol, and then here's the, it's a $5 a document or a dollar a refill, I don't even know what they charge. But these companies are getting, just starting, and the opportunity to have more of them is vast. Particularly, I mean, not just within Athena, I think it's particularly with Athena, but, you know, all these guys that have bought these single, you know, Epic is like having a huge run right now in fantastic company culture, but the app was written in the 80s and it's still written in months. It is extremely inflexible, closed, uh, 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 narrow, uh, sort of lame user experience. So the opportunity to come and plug into non, you know, you can get your chops at a theater where it's easy to sell, but all of these folks that have built all, spent all this money on IT will be in real pain. Uh, with it very shortly. It's a different speech, uh, but one of the things that's going into buying these, the building these, those, these biospheres, is paying doctors more than they're making in order to get them to be your employee. So the average loss for a hospital in 2007, employing a doctor, loss for a hospital employing a doctor in 2007, was $70,000. Today it's $200,000. The average percentage of the hospital debt that was going to IT, which has very little residual value from a lending perspective, was 3%, today is 45. So they're about to be desperate enough to take a risk. They're going to be choosing between death and dishonor in about three years. As soon as the income guarantee comes to an end and the doctors say, well, anyway, it's been real. I'm going back across the street where I was last time you tried to cut my paycheck. So we need more disruption from you guys. Please. And that's our website, More Disruption, please. Uh, we've got partnerships, uh, we've got members of 400 now companies that have been starting. I couldn't find 30 companies uh, investing in real disruption in healthcare, uh, disruptive technology in healthcare five years ago. Um, there are 400 today, a lot of them are you know, garage dwellers with no, no money. Um, so if you're a VC and you want to meet some of them, join. If, you're, if you've got, you made this kind of investment and you want to help with sales, uh, and distribution, uh, and whatever other advice, we've got a Washington office, we're going to start a PAC. Uh, we've got a big <laughs> Atlanta office. Uh, we would love to help. Kyle Armister is the head dude uh, on it. 
And I have uh, 10 minutes if anybody wants to ask a question. I've got five minutes. It says 10, but I'm going to go with you because you said that with such verb. <laughs> <laughs> or we get nothing like extra five minutes of time, too. Oh, we do. You have a question. You have a microphone for a guy who has a question. All right. Did I die? Was it terrible? <laughs> Clearly, the best speech we've ever had adventures on. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that we're ever going to do this again. Oh, yeah! We're going to run this out of town. But that was wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Um, what is your opinion? Tell your doctor. Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion on Obamacare, and what's that going to do to your business and businesses like yours? Well, my opinion uh, and Athena's opinion aren't um, exactly the same. Uh, so highly visible, terrifying creations of complexity and change turn out to be a thing that uh, Athena profits from. Um, probably the market should be more complicated with more people trying more things, but no one's trying anything because they're all racing around trying to get their meaningful use, stage two, checklist built in to figure out how they're going to do with this, this one guy, you know, six guys from saying, we went to Harvard, we'll innovate, it'll be great, everyone follow us. And by the way, John will arrest you. You know, it would be fine, except for the last sentence. Uh, but anyway, it's created lots of fuss and excitement uh, and attention in the medical records space, which I think Athena has profited from. On the flip side, it's caused a lot of people to rush to whatever technology they knew. So Athena's biggest problem is that most people, most doctors have never heard of us. They don't believe, they didn't know what a cloud-based business service was. Um, so. You know, personally, it would have been nice to see more shopping, more innovation, more freedom to solve this problem in many ways. You know, cross-subsidizing a shitty, disrespectful, massively overpriced system, as opposed to sort of creating a marketplace that brings that system to a more diverse, more responsive place. You know, but hell, we didn't do it. You know, I bet you know if, if, if average Americans feel we're kind of babies, right? And we have an issue, like. If we feel enough pain for long enough and the marketplace doesn't step up and do it, our legislative you know, representatives are just going to buckle and they're going to make something happen so that they, so that they won't cry and squeeze that trigger. And I think sort of, I sort of feel guilty. You know, I, I want to yell at Obama, but it's kind of an error constantly. You know, the unsuccessful women's health center entrepreneur is there. <laughs> Did you have a question? If we had all put money into disruptive clinics, all these stupid surgeries that go on in the hospital at five times their cost wouldn't be happening right now. Healthcare would cost a third of what it cost. And we all went that would be legal, too complicated on the internet. Selling petfood.com was easier, so we all went there. And I'm just saying, go where people do work, do it for results, and you know, get a great chance to be a hero. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start up this presenting this afternoon. And, uh, we, uh, we've been focusing on health IT as one of our target segments, and I just was recently in Washington, D.C. with uh, Rebecca Fayette, who's the Chief Privacy Officer for the Advisory Board, and she handed me a document called the Business Associate Agreement. She had said, if you sign this, then you can do this. If you don't sign this, you can't do this. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah, you've obviously seen the Business Associate Agreement and the downstream. I think I've signed like 6,000 of them, and I have to get a machine that signs them. <laughs> so if he said that a single cloud provider could sign them, we would be the first. And um, it wouldn't be the first, but very few do. Right. The downstream liability. So what's your advice for us? Yeah, great to point. Know. This is a great point. So most VCs and vendors say, I'm going to sign that. It's not my problem. I'm going to the technology. It's not actually working. Technology works properly. My advice is to go the exact opposite direction. We, don't, we not only are a covered entity under HIPAA, not only do we have associate, uh, business associate agreements, we have provided associate agreements. We have a need to know access to every patient, piece of patient information. We even carry malpractice liability and do aspects of the doctor's work that the doctor delegates to us because it's repetitive. My argument is go to a higher risk, lower margin, more messed up piece of the supply chain, and you'll be able to grow and innovate. It's like a, it's almost like a Japanese kar karetsu, you know? You're protected by the fact that everyone thinks you're crazy. Uh, for signing this shit, you know? But I love that. I mean, I am crazy. But 
<laughs> you know, you're just a crazy one. Steve Jobs. You know, I mean, I, I, obviously it's insane from the perspective of a tr traditional maker of software that you would put yourself at that kind of risk that some other idiot is going to use your software in a way that causes harm and they're going to come down, you know, up your porch and, and, and light you on fire. There's no question about the insanity of it. But this is the game. Like, that's why there are so few players. That's why there are so few investors. And anyway, what are they going to do? If you're doing good, right, you've got to go. One of the things you have to do is log time in Washington. you got to go down there and say, you know, I'm the guy who told them that 35% of abnormal fat fear results don't get to the patient. Right? They didn't know. They don't have access to a database with 40 million patient records that is live in real time and accurate and curated exactly the same way. Right? They, these are reasonable people, but they're just trying to play the game with the socialist planner so that the, the, the logistical complexity of their problem solving is overwhelming. So you just got to sign up for their rules and then educate them, but play a different game. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a really great point, and that's sort of the theme here, right? Get inside that food chain. Be at risk for everybody's mistakes. And you can not get sound because I'm wrong. It's going more amazing if you want to do that. Uh, I don't know. I either have negative Five minutes, depending on. Should I wrap it up? Wrap it up. Thank you guys very much. That was awesome.